We're going to go into our uh, next speaker and we're bringing out the heavy hitters and we're um, very excited to have uh, Nina here. And uh, thank you so much for being here. I have a little introduction and, uh, but I do know Rena on a personal level. It's so good to see you. And uh, from the, the uh, Lummi community here where I reside as well. And uh, Rena P Priest is an enrolled member of Lactamish uh, Lummi Nation. She served as the sixth Washington State Poet, Poet Laureate from 2021 to 2023 and was named the Maxine Cushing Gray Distinguished Writing Fellow by the University of Washington Libraries. Priest is also the recipient of an American Book Award, an Allied Arts Foundation Professional Poets Award, and fellowships from the Academy of American Poets and Indigenous Nations Poets. She is the author of three books and editor of two anthologies, and she holds an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College. So, Rena, thank you so much for being here today. We're looking forward to your good words, and uh, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so happy to be joining you all today to share some poetry and some thoughts and have a conversation with you afterwards. So I'll just start by saying that when I was first appointed as Poet Laureate, some of the questions that came were, is there, people wanted to know if there was a word for poet or poem in the language. And so I went to my Aksalas, to my teachers, and I asked, and they said, well, it could be a tiwiach, which is a prayer. It could be a stilam, which is a is a song or it can be a shwiam, which is a story. And I was really happy to hear that because um, to make meaning in life, I think that we need all three, you know, the prayers to, to um, seek hope and the stories to imagine a way forward and to remember how it was and the songs to give us strength and lighten our feet along the way. So I was really happy to hear that those are the three words that we could use for poem or poet. Um, and so I'll just start this reading, this, this um, what I'll share with you today, I'll start with a poem that I worked on recently and um, worked with our Shalangan office at Lummi to um, get their input on, on how to share it because it's a story, it's, it's based on a traditional story and it was written for the um, Land Conservancy, which they they um, have, they solicit poems from poets um, to celebrate protected lands. And they wanted me to write about Vendovi Island. And Vendovi Island is, um, you know, in my traditional homelands. And I visited, they, as part of it, they, they brought me out there um, the San Juan Island Land Conservancy brought me out there and there's like nothing about you know original inhabitants and we're working on fixing that I think we're going to possibly put this poem together with some information um, in the signage for when people arrive on the island so that it's not just you know colonizer history um, uh, and it's a significant place so this is called creation story with the title like that I can see how you might assume that this is a poem about life breathed into clay and the man's rib and the woman and the snake. But no, it's not that one with the despot God and all that thou shalt not. This is the one about Kwame and Quilshan two mountains standing regal in my homelands, and how through their parting of ways, the islands of the Salish Sea came into being. A long time ago, the two mountains were married. For some reason, who knows why, one day, Kwame decided it was time to be on her way. She had a flair for the dramatic and her salty tears became the swirling eddies of the Salish Sea. Soon all that crying made her tired. She set down her tuckwitch, her bow, to have a bit of quillal, camis. And when she got up to go, in her sorrow, she forgot her tuckwitch and dropped a little piece of her quillal. These became islands the people now know as 
Tukwich, the island shaped like a bow, and Pananachwang, the island where we go to Kanach to dig for Hualal. She went along this way, leaving gifts for the Hualmuch, the people, and the gifts have stories to map the bounty in the garden of the Salish Sea. When she arrived where she stands today, she decided that was far enough away. Sometimes on a clear day, you can see her all the way from her old homelands where once she stood with handsome Quilshan, and he likes to catch a glimpse of her glowing majestically in the rare sunshine. He could look at her and nothing else for the rest of his life, but soon she decides it can't go on this way and draws the clouds around her face to disappear back into the gray. And that's how the ancestors explain how these blankets of clouds, the falling rain. Sorry, I changed it and then I didn't change it back. <laughs> it used to say, um, uh, and that is, and that is why it rains here all the time or something like that. I can't remember, <laughs> but um, I'm still playing with the ending. Um, the old ending is the one that will be published, but uh, one thing about this when we're when we're using these stories um it's important to acknowledge that this is just one iteration that this is one version that this is from a living tradition that is flexible and always changing and um and has different interpretations so i wanted to share that but anyhow um the idea well so poetry is useful in being able to talk about big, hard things because it doesn't try to define them for you um, or get you to see things one way or the other. It just kind of puts these thoughts out there and then it invites readers to think and form their own ideas about it. Um, and food sovereignty is hard, you know, because it's not like an, an accident what happened to the buffalo and the salmon. That was intentional and it was... Um, part of the campaign to break down indigenous resistance by removing food sovereignty, by removing our ability to sustain ourselves. And so to say that is, um, it feels kind of aggressive, but if you put it in a poem, people might be like, oh, I can feel that, you know, um, <laughs> maybe we hope. I don't know. Um, I think it's 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 helpful too. People always say that I say it in a nice way, <laughs> but uh but it's still being said, which I think is important. And this is a poem called Solastalgia. And, and um, Solastalgia is an idea. It's, an, it's a word that was invented by an Australian philosopher to talk about the feeling that people have, um, you know how like you can have nostalgia for different times, um, nostalgia for the past. Well, Solastalgia is um, that feeling sort of like a longing or, or an emptiness or a grief brought on by the absence of a landscape as it once was. So um, they, in defining it, have been used, it, it's been useful, um, they've used it to sue corporations that do like big open pit mines and things like that, that alter the landscape so drastically that people who live there are impacted in very real kind of emotional ways. Um, and I feel like that word kind of really, I, I resonated with it. So this is called Solastalgia. So we to is Shutanakun, the truly beautiful earth. This used to be a garden. Before the strangers came with strange beliefs, they claimed to be cursed with something they called original sin, but blessed with something else called dominion over the whole living earth. They savaged the garden, insisted the verdant wilds be conquered and subdued in order to be improved. We are part of the earth, thus their belief that we too must be subdued. Have they forgotten this used to be a garden? On the seventh day, did they look upon their work and see that it is good? Now we need our old beliefs to guide us back to the garden beyond that gate, guarded by their angel with a fiery sword. This used to be a garden. I don't think the strangers knew how the garden grew so carefully attuned to the rhythms and tones of the earth's own beautiful song, sung for untold millennia before they came along. This used to be a garden. It fed us and loved us, and we loved it. We still do, or at least the memory of it. 
I've heard it said that half histories are half truths and half truths are lies. Let me tell it to you whole. This used to be a garden. So the way that I was taught is that um, the islands, you know, and this is kind of mentioned in the previous poem, but the islands of the Salish Sea were the traditional Lummi homelands, um, but they were cultivated in uh, like a reciprocal way with, in, in a reciprocal and balanced way, like um, Lummi Island, for example, is called Smamiach because that's where we went to harvest deer. The Smayas lived there. And Pananahuang is was the place where we went to dig whole hall. And, you know, there's other places named after like the seagull rock where we went to gather seagull eggs is named for the, um, for the quinine, the, the seagull, um, and so on and so forth. So it was a big garden that our, our ancestors just traveled through from village site to village site to harvest and preserve um, in the ways that they had. And it was a technology, really. It is a technology in the ways that um, they had been taught for generations, hundreds and hundreds of generations. Um, and I think it's important to share that not only with our own indigenous people, but with the non-indigenous people, because they, I once was in a reading with a really well-respected poet who said, the indigenous people were here for hundreds of years. <laughs> and I said, no, no, tens of thousands of years um, we've been here. So, you know, that relationship to the land, it goes deep, it runs deep, um, and there's a purpose for everything. And so some of what poetry can accomplish is opening up like a safe and comfortable space to talk about these things um, that are very hard as you'll hear in this next poem. Um, I was raised Catholic and there's a reason for that too, but um, this is the, this talks about that. This is called, you will know them by their fruits when it's based on true events. <laughs> you will know them by their fruits, Matthew seven sixteen. The Library of Congress has a Gutenberg Bible on display, a monument marking the moment it all went to hell, I say to myself as I turn my back and walk away, as if she can hear my blasphemous thoughts and thinks herself on a mission from God, I am petitioned on the street by a Christian youth who asks if I believe. I tell her my indigenous ways serve just fine for me. She asks, what is that, like new age? No, I say, it's very old. It predates Christianity. She asks, what will govern society if not God's command? I tell her about resonance, the works of your hands in harmony with what you feel and what you think. She argues that society and God must show the way. I tell her how society and God results in stolen Indian land and stolen Indian babes buried in unmarked graves behind churches. She says that as a woman of color, she knows the sins of the colonizer, then says God is good, despite how individuals behave. I smile, resist the urge to tell her the truth. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. So that's challenging, right? I mean, like if you're, if you're Christian, that's challenging, but it's, it's a poem. So it's also, um, it's also just a perspective and it's it's a safe place to say it. Uh, and then I'll just take it one more step further and then I'll change gears. But this one's called The Miracle of the Fishes. Um, and I feel like it does do a good job of opening dialogue. I've had clergy come up to me after readings and talk and say how much they appreciate, you know, hearing this perspective. And um, I'll share a little bit more about it once I read, but this is called The Miracle of the Fishes. I don't want to get into a thing where we're arguing about whose spiritual hero is better, but salmon are more powerful than Jesus. All salmon are born from virgins. Actually, they're born right out of the earth. Female salmon lay eggs in a riverbed. The males come and fertilize them. No male-female contact is made. How chaste. The young salmon make their journey to the sea, then return to perform the miracle of the fishes. 
They spawn and die in their nutrient-rich bodies and blood and fuse with the minerals of the living sea, feed all living beings in the salmon's natal stream. A salmon needs only itself and its journey to perform this miraculous feat. This beautiful and holy communion between salmon and all living things has been happening longer than people have been on this planet. On the other hand, basic transubstantiation requires a priest, a church, an altar, a tabernacle, an altar boy, a glass of wine, a tray of wafers, a bell, a Bible, dogma, an initiated congregation, the Spanish Inquisition, a history of burning women as witches, a history of stealing and starving Indian kids, a history of holy wars, a history of displacing and murdering heathen Indians in the name of God in order to propagate a story about a boy born from a virgin who's body and blood we eat and drink so we shall be saved. Saved from what? Not from hunger or thirst, but from everlasting damnation in the burning pits of hell, which if I close my eyes to visualize looks suspiciously like hunger and thirst on this broken and burning earth. So that one, that one um, you know, I always kind of worry about putting that one out there. Um, might get canceled one of these days, but you know, uh, it's another perspective. But it it raises the question of about you know where we place belief, right? And um, I heard it put really beautifully by a scholar of Indigenous literature. Um, where I went to graduate school, Arnold Krupat, um, this was just a few years ago during the pandemic, he offered a workshop um, and on indigenous literature. And he said of all of the stories that he's read in all of the different traditions throughout the world, there's only one where the people like rise up out of the dirt and then are displaced from their homelands. And that's Christianity and all of the other stories in every tradition that he's ever encountered, the people rise up out of the earth and then they're introduced to the other beings that they share the space with. And then they're taught how to behave and interact with those beings in a, in a harmonious way. And I thought that was a really interesting and really beautiful way to talk about it and to think about it. Because when, if you don't, if you, if you go into, um, you know, a cathedral or closed walls, a, a building of stone and wood, and you're separate and you, you know, or you're worshiping a man who lived 2000 years ago, it is a disconnect from the things that you rely on uh, for food sovereignty, for a way of life, for a way of sustaining yourself in the real world. Um, but if you connect to those things spiritually, it, it's, um, it creates a bond and, I remember my grandma used to say this thing all the time, when the tide is out, the table is set, right? And so this poem is called Remembering Sila at Shwilisen that talks a little bit about this bond. And Sila is our word at Lummi for grandmother and Shwilisen is the place name for where um, the crossing where we used to go and get our shellfish. Sometimes you still can, but sometimes it's um, red tide. Remembering Sila at Shwilisen, we used to say when the tide is out, the table is set, the earth provided, and if one day it didn't, the spirit fed us, the glittering turn of the tide, the arc of the sun in the sky, the call of birds, the sound of waves, to be nourished in this way, makes glass doors opening and closing themselves between me and that food on grocery store shelves seem false, empty, that food. Where does it come from? Whose hands grew it? Was there patience and care? Were there prayers? Think of how it got there, what it's made of. When I was a girl, everything we ate came from the earth that left us through the hands of people we loved. So I shared this, um, I shared this manuscript with a poet I really admire. Um, I guess I, I'm gonna name drop. <laughs> Should I name drop? I'll name drop. I shared it with Joy Harjo and her comment on that poem was, um, I loved what she said. Um, do you, do you, do you talk to the food you bring home from your grocery store? <laughs> 
Um, right. Because it's just like, you know, you go get some pop tarts and you bring it home and it's so sacred. No, I don't think so. Um, but, you know, you go get a fish and you tell it thank you and you bring it home and you tell it thank you. And uh, as you're cleaning it and everything else. Right. So it's it's a different way of being. It's a different way of interacting. Um, and then you you save all that gratitude for Sunday for someone you know, your, your savior, if you're, if you're a Christian, but not to be down on that. But anyways, uh, this one is called a poem is a naming ceremony. What has grown out of what has gone away? The clear cut patch has grown larger on the mountain. The rivers have grown murky with timber trash, and there's enough runoff cow manure to grow corn out there in the tide flats. I don't want to think about what has gone away. I want to meander and play and forget myself until I can grow a new me in place of all this grief. Learn the language to see the cottonwood as quail each, the dancing tree, the killer whales as quilhomachin, our relatives under the sea, the whole glorious landscape filled with meaning to end my grieving. When I was young, I was invited to learn Quilnuchkin the people's language, but I said, no, I didn't understand. I thought I wanted to learn how to be rich. I didn't know that the only way to possess all the wealth of the world is by naming it. Here is bird song. Here is the kiss of a lover. Here is the feel of cold water at the peak of summer. I have spent my life with words trying to name a hint of what I lost by not learning my language. Estetemsen, tutatistsen, estetemsen. And that means I'm doing my best. I'm still learning. I'm doing my best. Let's see here. Um, so next, I think I'll read you. Hmm. I'll read. Yeah, let's do that. I was invited recently because um, our last speaker, Dune, talked a little bit about the, the glaciers melting. Um, that's really a powerful image when you see it in certain ways. I was invited to uh, an event that was hosted by the National Park Service. They invited artists from all over the place to memorialize the glaciers that will be disappearing from the national from the Olympic National Park um, within the next decade um, through art. And it was really a powerful event, but also so sad. <laughs> um, and, you know, one of the artists, she explained to me her the work that she did, which was a little model of what it looked like in the 1970s and what it looks like today. And um, she made it by painting layer upon layer of this this white paint into the little um, form that she had made that was identical to to what the glacier what the what the landscape actually looks like and letting it dry and then she'd add another coat just to kind of give her a feeling a condensed feeling of the time that it took to accumulate that snow and then to see it like you know less and less that there's only just like one little breast stroke of that now um that was really powerful and also very sad, but she explained to me how crucial glaciers are to the success of salmon because salmon, salmon need that water and they need that coldness from um, glacier melt running down the stream in order to be like ab above a certain temperature, they become very sluggish, I understand, and then they don't want to go up so far. It's a lot harder for them to manage in warmer water. Um, but anyways, so I was invited to give the keynote address at that event, and uh, I'll just share that with you. When I think of glaciers, I think of time, the slow, accumulate, the slow accumulation of snow, eons of pressure turning the delicate weight of a snowflake into a river of ice, shining blue as it imperceptibly flows amid its lofty banks of crags and peaks. Thinking of glaciers challenges our human perception of time and how we move through it. The topic of time and human perception has fascinated me for decades. 
My very first professor of poetry told us a story of how he spent the afternoon watching a slug move along a garden path. He wondered to us if the slow mode of the slug meant it could see flowers turn their beautiful heads toward the sun. He invited us to live in that time where we needn't time lapse to apprehend such subtlety. We could live there in poetry. Memory preserves, writing preserves, art preserves. Memory is sometimes a comfort, a refuge, a place of radiance. Memory is also a mirror. Art is a mirror. How do we perceive ourselves in relation to what? I'm here to talk about glaciers, seemingly timeless. They offer another way of thinking about time. I am here to talk about the sustaining nature of beauty. What is beautiful? Why are we so driven by what we deem beautiful? Can we shift our definition of beauty? How powerful even a slight shift could be as a motivator for change. When you walk into a grand hotel, do you think it beautiful? I remember once when my daughter was small, we had the opportunity to stay in a grand historic hotel in Boston. We walked in and she surveyed the sparkle with eyes that twinkled and she lilted, this is how it's supposed to be. It's a nice memory, though now I'm unable to see beauty in those gold leafed monuments to conquest, unable to feel anything, but this is not how it's supposed to be. In these grand and ornate places, I see inequality, oppression, exploitation of labor, a genocidal legacy of land theft and slavery, the pain of struggle in the lives of the people who toil here all day, the meanness of communities that live with want and lack. If you see only the Rococo, if you can take comfort in the luxuries of such a space, you have no way of fully seeing the deprivations that enable that comfort, cannot apprehend the crimes perpetrated to enable it. Even in public lands, where you visit and think you see beauty, the pure beauty of nature, anywhere in America, you must know that here too is a crime. But this means that here too can be justice, justice for the people, the land, the non-human communities who live here. It may require only the smallest shift in perception. The idea of time, synchronized time, didn't happen until October of 1884, when the International Meridian Conference determined that the Greenwich Meridian would be the prime meridian and Greenwich Median Time was set as the entire world's standard. Was there a fight? Did railways and towns feel the government was interfering with their lives? It would seem that prior to synchronized time, people lived by the sun and chaos. Now, school students across the world rise every 50 minutes at the sound of bells and carry themselves to their next class, as they say, like clockwork. Though clocks, too, like flowers and glaciers, are always imperceptibly shifting. Like thoughts and glaciers, they drift a moment here, a moment there. Even the most precise timepiece strays a nanosecond from true. And what is true? Says who? If the world could agree at a conference in 1884 to march together to the same beat, then upon what else can we agree? What decision could be made in a day? What idea could take hold so powerfully that we could universally alter our collective understanding of reality? By the act of March 1st, 1872, Congress agreed to establish Yellowstone as a national park, and so a movement was born. Yes, the concept of national parks is older than synchronized time and exactly as old as John Gast's famous painting, American Progress, the visual representation of manifest destiny. And now in this destiny that was so brut brutally manifested, the future of our children and all non-human communities on the planet are at stake. By an act of Congress, by a proposal outlined at an international conference, could we agree to shift just a little bit and make things new? the way we made parks and synchronized time. What needs shifting? To what beliefs do we cling so dearly that we are willing to ride them to our demise? Is asserting the supremacy of man still a valid project? Are we still to go forth and subdue the earth by any means, to rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground? 
Is there still hope for humankind? How can we know? We know because we've been told about things, how things were not so very long ago. It has only been 11 short human lifetimes since the signing of treaties, the synchronization of time, the confiscation of Indian lands to establish national parks. 11 short human lifetimes to find ourselves so far from where we started. Surely from such a short distance, we can find our way back. But first we must admit we are lost and retrace our steps to see where we made our wrong turn. The answer won't be easy. People won't like it. There will be struggle. But remember the struggles that brought us here. Buffalo and salmon piled up in wasted mounds to destroy indigenous food sovereignty, to break down the tools of indigenous resistance, Indian children hauled off by the thousands to starve in residential schools. Indigenous peoples have endured the action that brought us to this moment. Together, we must endure what it takes to find our way back. For descendants of colonizers, building a vision for a just future requires an act of imagination. For tribes, the vision for justice is an act of remembrance. Here is Nisqually ancestor Billy Frank Sr. sharing a remembrance and a vision by recalling the Nisqually homelands of his youth. He said, there were plenty of fish coming up the river in those days. Oh, a lot of fish. I seen fish crowding each other out of the creek. There were so many fish coming up Mill Creek right over here at Lacey. The silver salmon come spawn at the lake, Long Lake. I seen the fish shove each other out of the creek. There were so many coming up. Everything grew here. The white man calls it roots now, roots. Well, I guess they were roots because they grew out of the ground. They were carrots, potatoes, onions, a plant like an onion. It had layers all around it and a whole lot of other plants, you know. The Indian used to gather it up and bake. They'd take it down to the river where there's a big jam, a lot of wood, and they'd bake it all together. They had this plant like a carrot, but it was very little. They were short and black and it was sweet, very sweet, and it would sweeten all these other foods that they baked. One carrot would sweeten all the other foods like camas and the root of the sunflower. They cooked that, that made nice eating. And game, grouse, pheasant, and all kinds of birds in the trees. They would just ring in the woods. They were called grouse. They would ring in the woods. There were so many of them around in the trees. And the Indians had plenty of birds to eat and plenty of game like deer and beaver and bear and all that, plenty of everything. I think the Nisqually Indian here was living the perfect life. He didn't have to cultivate the stuff. It grew here. Mother, ma Mother Nature made it grow every year. Nobody had to fertilize that stuff. It just came up every year. Wow, these Indians were living in paradise. That's what I always said. Paradise. How do we find our way back there? What can I do? What can you do? We live our true life, we talk, we hope, we pray, we educate, we vote, we surrender lesser wishes for the greater good. We seek, we listen, we think, we create. We create for beauty, shift our vision of beauty from material to kindness. Are we kind to the earth, to each other? We see through the eyes of the other and search for a way to understand, search for the place where we can have a meeting of minds because we live on this burning planet together. This is our only home, our only hope. I have come to talk about glaciers, impermanence, and the sustaining nature of beauty. What is beautiful? Why are we so driven by what we deem beautiful? Can we shift our definition of beauty? How powerful even a small shift could be. So I just wanted to share that, um, the, the quote, the passage from Billy Frank Sr. is from as a, a documentary called As Long As the River Runs. Um, that's where I encountered it anyways. And it just really was, was very powerful to think about that instruction, you know, that memory about uh, how it was, that's how it could be, right? Um, I really love that. So anyways, I wanted to leave some, some time for questions. So the rest of the time will be for questions. Rena, thank you so much. Um, raising our hands to you and just thanking you for the, the good words and thoughtful words and strong consideration of those words. And uh, what came to mind for me was just a courageous warrior 
taking on the big battles and a challenging time itself. That was amazing. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. And we're going to turn it over to Aaron to um, uh, take over the, the Q&A section. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Rena. That um, is so powerful and getting in front of a, a group of people who you can't see in this <laughs> digital format um, and just sharing so vulnerably and, and fully um, is a, a huge act of love and, and a gift to all of us. So thank you for that. Um, and I will share some questions from the audience. Um, and if we have time, maybe discuss a little bit, a little bit more. Um, the first is from Alexandria um, and they say, how do you stay hopeful? Uh, what is your practice to build capacity and joy to keep writing poetry? And I, you did speak to this in, in some of what you read as well, but um, I'd love for you to elaborate. Yeah, so I think that like um, writing poems helps me stay hopeful. Um, this, mm. like learning about um, the science of climate crisis, weirdly also, uh, if you find, if you look in the right places, it can actually give you a lot of hope. I read this really great book recently called um, Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid by Tor Hansen. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the science, the the like biology of of how climate crisis is changing species, and it talks about like um, resilience and plasticity in species, um, and gives examples of how different beings are responding to the different the shifts in their environment. You know, um, and it's just so amazing how how like you know he talked about these birds. And how they were, the scientists all were like, oh, they're a goner. When the ice sheet recedes, they're done. They're, you know, because they're going to have to fly so far to get their food. But they adapted. They like found a way to adapt and still have their their niche food. Um, and so they're doing better than ever. Or uh, these squid that seem to have just vanished off the face of the earth. What happened was they used to be big and uh, they they like, made an evolutionary decision to now be small so it's the same biological being but they're not big anymore and so like the fishermen that used to catch them on these big hooks the reason they thought they had disappeared is because they're too small now like the fully grown adults are too small to like latch onto those hooks and so they're just down there living their best life like um <laughs> as smaller squid um not to say that you know we could just keep going the way that we're going and everything will be okay but that you know there are these pockets of hope where you see how resilient and adaptable nature is really um and people as part of nature that we can find solutions we're smart we've we've been going along for a long time figuring things out and then if we don't then you know will everything be better off without us anyways so <laughs> I don't know, probably, <laughs> um, but you know, the salmon certainly, who I have deep affection for. Um, anyhow, that's that's. Thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah, that's that's beautiful. Um, Charlene asks, "Hi, Rena. Uh, as someone who was also raised within Christianity, but saw the hypocrisy within it, what led you on your current journey to search for more?" Thank you for sharing your powerful poetry and experiences. Yeah, well, so I think, so my grandma was taken to boarding school when she was six years old and um, was deeply, deeply Catholic, but I feel that it was in response to um, the trauma that she experienced through, you know, Catholic boarding school. And sort of, I think, learning more about our own traditions and our own ways and participating in, you know, our culture has, has been the shift and how beautiful it is, just really how beautiful and actually sustaining it is. Um, and then also seeing like the, the patriarchal structure of Catholicism and how damaging that is to women. It, it, and then as the result, women being, you know, the givers of life like how destructive it is to everything <laughs> really um yeah it's it's crazy um especially when you learn about like well it just wasn't even very long ago you know the the witch trials and all of that kind of thing 
but also the idea that <clears throat> you can you can have one I, one thing that works for everybody worldwide didn't seem to fit either because localized belief systems that interact with where you live and where you are, I think are very important to being able to like maintain the health and, and be um, respectful and reciprocal. Thank you. Um, and I, I heard in, in the origin story poem, um, it, it evoked a memory of um, Robin Kimmerer's uh, so, uh, imagined meeting of of Eve and Sky Woman um, <laughs> that you know just <laughs> to me was so beautifully encapsulated in in the the phrase the response um, sister you got a raw deal <laughs> um, and that just For sure <laughs> you know <laughs> captured so much um, I want to move on to to Morgan's question here. Um, are there places you go, relatives you seek out, human, non-human, ways you nurture, love yourself that bring you inspiration and creative energy as an Indigenous poet or artist? Um, yeah. What And what does self-care look like for you um, as you sustain all the good medicine you share with the world? I used to go, I used to love to spend time with my grandma. I was named after her. Um, I, I, she was so great. She wrote poetry too. Um, but she was a lot of fun. She was just kind of like a very silly person, <laughs> which I, I try to like carry that forward. There's like so much value in humor and being lighthearted, um, especially during heavy times. Sometimes, you know, it feels a little bit like avoiding the, the difficulties, but I think, in other times, it's, it's the appropriate amount of like uh, stepping aside from whatever is happening and then seeing seeing it for, you know, in another way. Uh, but I go to my daughter a lot. She's really funny, too. I like to spend time with her because she's uh, the like, you know, the perspective of a young person. She doesn't seem troubled by any of it. <laughs> I don't think that it's that she doesn't know about it. I think that she understands that it's really important to um, live life and value life and be um, in the moment as much as possible because that's where we're most valuable, most effective. Thank you. Um, there was one question from the chat. Um, can you please, uh, I believe this was from Shelly, um, can you please tell us more about your next publication? Uh, will there be a main theme? And second, um, will you be going into schools to share your poetry and teachings? Um, I did a lot of school visits during my tenure as Poet Laureate and at the, of Washington State, and that was a lot of fun. Um, the next, so I, I published a book about beaches in 2022. And then this year I published a collection, an anthology of poems about salmon, but they were by other people. I put a call out last August and it was for, I, I received funding from the Academy of American Poets to do this project. And so there was like deadlines. Um, and I, I put the call out in August thinking, oh, maybe I'll get a hundred poems, you know, and I'll have this like little volume of salmon poems. And I got 700 poems. It was crazy because um, it was only open for two months. And in two months, people from all across the state sent sent work. And I had to kind of really make hard choices about what would go in. And, um, and I'm really happy with how the collection turned out. The cover art is by a Squaxin Island artist named Joe Seymour. And then there's a graphic in there from a Lummi artist named Jason LeClaire. And um, and I think it, it's gotten some good reviews and the it's actually was the number one seller on the independent presses um, distributor, small press distributions, I think it's called. They're like one of the main um, distributors of small presses or maybe the main press um, or main distributor. And so they, they, keep tally of the numbers and it was number one in August and I think it was number two in July so it's been doing pretty good and all of the proceeds from that collection are going to the press that published it they're called Empty Bowl Press 
and they're a nonprofit press and they they work to publish um things that might not otherwise get published you know because publishing is such a weird market like you you have to if it doesn't appeal to like a broad audience somehow people might say mm, you know we don't really want to take a risk because it costs so much money to publish but but they publish poets that are um, tackling important issues so and then the new book hopefully it'll come out um I, I thought I had a home for it but it wasn't really as good of a fit once we started talking um, as I thought it would be so the new collection is still trying to I'm still trying to find a home for it <laughs> Well, congratulations on the on the current success, and we can't wait to see what what comes next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rena, and um, thank you everyone for the questions. And I'm not sure if you were able to see the chats or the hearts and clapping hands and thumbs up for you, Rena. But there's a lot of appreciation out here. I did want to uh, acknowledge and recognize uh, Quants Tanat, uh, one of your. <laughs> One of our fellow uh, Lummi uh, participants here, Candice, is on here, and she said Heishka, and uh, she's uh, very happy for you. So thanks so much for being here with us today. They have the website on the, in the chat as well for, for your website, and uh, uh, folks can find out more resources there. But we really appreciate your time and, and courage and uh, the good words that you brought, the connection between uh, poetry and and uh, food sovereignty and just a beautiful weaving of of those worlds. So thank you for that presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and hi Shka. and hello everyone. Uh, hi Candace and Bree. I see some people in the chat yeah. now. I couldn't see you while my glasses were off, but I see you now. So hi everyone. Thanks for coming. We'll do our sign language uh, big round of applause, but we're sorry we can't see everyone uh, uh, giving you a big round of applause, but lots of hearts and claps for you. Hi, Shka. Thank you.